Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the April 2018 New York Arts Chapter meeting. Tonight we have, <clears throat> as usual, one of our best presenters, who is also a member of our chapter, Gary Galo, who is the audio engineer emeritus from the Crane School of Music, SUNY at Potsdam, not Purchase, Potsdam, New York. Tonight he's gonna to talk about two uh, interesting digital kind of restoration and uh, restoration procedures or decisions on what to do digitally on how to enhance um, various problems that arise when you're dealing with stereo signals as well as recording in the older PCM format. Uh, the first half of this program, which I'll introduce, and then I will introduce the other half when we get to it, is about digital phase correctors and stereophonic recordings. To phase correct or to not to phase correct, that is the question. Uh, phase correction software is included with many digital audio editing and restoration programs. Stereo playback of monaural source material, both disc and tape have multiple advantages, and phase correction software can be extremely useful for aligning the two channels prior to summing them to mono. Engineers who have specialized in transfer and restoration of pre-stereo material can easily misinterpret the Lisa Zhu patterns, which you're seeing up there, and Gary will explain all that, produced by stereophonic recordings as a defect requiring correction. This paper will examine the basics of stereophonic recording, the phase, uh, yeah, excuse me, the phase relationship of the two stereo channels created by common microphone techniques, and the need to exercise proper judgment before quote unquote fixing something that may not be broken. This is a slightly expanded version of a presentation given at the ARSC National Conference in San Antonio, Texas last May of 2017. So let me introduce Gary Galo for the evening. When he finishes that presentation, I'll go on to what he will talk about, about the PCM format of recording that was a very early digital uh, format back, what is it, almost 30 years ago now? 81, so it's over almost 40 years ago. So. Gary, it is all yours. Thank you. Well, Seth just gave the commentary to the first slide, so I think I'll move on, on to the uh, second one. I'd like to start by getting a little terminology straight, because phase and polarity are often used interchangeably, but they should not be. It's easy to use an asymmetrical waveform to show the difference, and musical waveforms are almost always asymmetrical, unlike test tones. A phase difference between two audio signals is a difference in time, and in the top illustration, waveform B lags behind waveform A by 180 degrees. This is a phase difference. In the bottom illustration, waveform B is inverted relative to waveform A, and this is a polarity difference. And this is what happens when you reverse the leads to one of the speakers in your stereo system. And most people say the speakers are out of phase, but they're not. That's technically incorrect. They're really of opposite polarity. Uh, we can forget about polarity for today's discussion. This, the, today's what we're talking about is phase. And we'll have a little bit to say about phase in, this, in the presentation in the second half as well. But I like to get that terminology straight because to some people, it's confusing, and I think we all have misused those terms from time to time. <clears throat> Most of you have used an oscilloscope to display a Lissajous pattern where you put the left channel into the horizontal input and the right channel into the vertical, and if the two channels are identical and in phase, you get a straight diagonal line from lower left to upper right. And then very quickly, a 45 degree phase difference produces an ellipse from lower left to upper right. A 90 degree phase difference produces a circle, and a 135 degree phase difference uh, gives us an ellipse, but this time it's from upper left to lower right. And finally, an 130, uh, and finally, a 180 degree phase difference gives us a straight diagonal line, but this time from upper left to lower right. Stereo playback of mono recordings is usually better than mono playback. Now, yes, I am aware that there are those out there who disagree with this, but that happens to be my viewpoint on the subject, and uh, if you hear me out, maybe I'll convert some of you who, who don't agree with that. Now, some of you may say that the left and right outputs of a stereo phono cartridge or a tape head will be identical when playing a mono recording. 
I agree that in a perfect world, this would probably be true, but the world of vintage recordings is unfortunately a long way from being perfect. Let's start with disc records first. <clears throat> Even with a monaural cutting head, the two record groove walls are rarely identical. And many mono records, especially by the 1970s, were actually cut with stereo cutters, and this almost ensures that the two groove walls won't be identical. By about 1970, as mono LPs were being phased out, a lot of record companies did not want to keep two sets of cutters on hand, so they had a stereo cutter only, and if a mono tape came in, they cut a mono record with a stereo cutter. The two groove walls will never be the same if you do that. Now the playback process is also imperfect because the cutter head moves in a straight line but a pivoted tone arm moves in an arc. And usually we align a phono cartridge for perfect tangency at two points near the outside and inside of the playing surface. But if you've done this, this is a compromise at best and cartridge alignment's going to be wrong at every other point along the playing surface. It may be pretty close but it's never going to be uh, ideal. There are other mono LP problems that can benefit from phase correction. The azimuth may be off, as we see here in the, in the left-hand illustration, and that's from a cartridge head which can be tilted from one side, uh, or head shell which is tilted from one side to the next. And unfortunately, a lot of head shells don't allow you to adjust for azimuth. They all should, but most of them don't. And the other thing is that stereo cartridges are imperfect. The left and right outputs are often not identical. And one thing uh, I have run into, I don't know if Seth has run into this, but some of the old uh, truncated elliptical styli that I have for my Stanton 500 AL cartridge that I use for 78s and other vintage material, I've got one or two of them where I know the magnets have shifted positions slightly and the left and right channels aren't even the same in level. So this, this can be a problem. And as, some, as many of you probably know, getting replacement styli for those cartridges is a bit of a problem these days. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is tape. Uh, the gentleman sitting to my left here, Seth and Dennis Rooney and Mike Shields, demonstrated the benefits of playing full track mono tapes with tracks two and three of a four channel head. And their ARSC journal article that I cite in the handout is required reading on this subject, uh, in my humble opinion. And again, if you don't have a handout, there are a lot of extras up on the music stand. And if you don't want to type in all of those uh, URLs that are on the handout, if you send me an email, I will just send you a copy of the handout. You can just click on those links. At any rate, stereo playback allows proper head adjustment. And if you use tracks two and three of a four-channel head, you get away from the edges of the tape where the most serious edge curl is likely to occur. I should also mention that tracks two and three of a four channel head work really well for old brush sound mirror tapes. Uh, I don't know if any of you have encountered these, but the brush sound mirror was a consumer tape recorder that was marketed in this country in 1946, and it had a single half track that went right down the center of the tape. And this head format works really well on, on brush sound mirror tapes. Now, phase correctors can be extremely useful in putting icing on the cake before summing the stereo playback to mono. Now, this is the window for the automatic phase corrector that comes with Adobe Audition 3.0. Now, I don't use Adobe Audition for, as an editor, and I never have, but it came with a couple of useful utilities, including the phase correction plugin and an excellent phase scope. And all of the scope illustrations that you see in this, in this presentation and the one I'm giving on the second half, they were all screen captures of the Adobe Audition phase scope. It worked, it's, it's a very, very good scope. Adobe considers version 3.0 obsolete, so you can now download it for free from the Adobe website. There are details in the handout. Let me say a couple of things about what's really going on there. A few years back, Adobe had a problem with their server <coughs> where you did activation of your program, and if you, had, if you had already purchased it and you needed to move it to another computer, you couldn't go online and activate it. So because, and they decided it wasn't worth repairing that server and getting it up and running again because they considered the program obsolete. So what they did is they posted a version on their website that doesn't require activation. They claim it's for people who were already registered users of the program. 
And they also have the disclaimer that it won't run on some newer operating systems. Uh, I'm running it fine under Windows 7, and I did uh, install it on one computer that didn't have a previous version of the program, and it worked fine. Uh, I know other people who have said they had a problem with it, but it's worth giving a try, because the face corrector does work quite well. Okay, these scope shots are from a full-track mono tape in the in the Crane School of Music recording archive. This is, happens to be Robert Shaw conducting the Berlioz Requiem from our 1954 Spring Festival, and this was from the original 15 IPS full track mono tape. I'm sure most of you recognize the piece from the picture, right? <laughs> I don't think it's the Requiem. Now, on the, on the left, <laughs> no, it's Romeo and Juliet. No, it really is the Requiem. On the left here, uh, is a properly aligned tape head, and on the right is that same tape head that I deliberately misaligned for demonstration purposes. Now this particular slide shows playback from the misaligned head before and after correction with the Adobe Audition phase corrector. Now as you can see, the phase corrector does an excellent job of bringing the two channels into alignment. Now, I did this for demonstration purposes, and I want to emphasize that a phase corrector should never be viewed as a band-aid for sloppy head alignment, because it can't compensate for the loss of high frequencies and detail due to a misaligned head. This was just for the purposes of illustration to show you that the phase corrector does indeed work. <clears throat> so here's what it's really good for. On the left, you see a properly aligned tape head, but this time it's playing a portion of the tape with some physical deformity. And if you worked with old acetate tapes, you know that physical deformation is a big problem with old acetate tape. And that's why the list you on the left is not completely closed at that moment in time. On the right, you can see the result of correction with the Adobe Audition phase corrector. And again, let me emphasize that a good transfer begins with the best possible playback of the source, which allows the phase corrector again then to put the icing on the cake. And at this point, you can be sure that you'll get the best possible sum to mono of the two channels. So we're going to hear a comparison. Uh, I'm going to play these without pause. The first three are in stereo. They're stereo playbacks of the mono tape. First is with the misaligned head. Second, with a properly aligned head. Third, a properly aligned head with the Adobe Audition phase correction. And finally, after phase correction and sum to mono. Now, big disclaimer, we're listening on what's basically a PA system here. There isn't anybody in this house that has, has an optimum seat between the two loudspeakers. I don't know how much anybody's going to be able to hear on any of these demonstrations I play in this half, but we'll give it a try. So let's play tracks one through four. the correctly aligned head Stereo with phase correction. Mm -hmm. 
to mono. Stop that for now. Can anybody hear anything? Okay, good. All right, what about stereophonic recordings? Well, before we make a judgment on whether or not phase correctors are appropriate for stereo recordings, I think a, a review of the basics of stereophonic recording is probably in order. Now, a stereo image is created by differences between the left and right channels, and there can be differences in intensity or volume and differences in phase, and usually it's a combination of both. This is a slide that shows the three most common microphone directional patterns. It'll, this will be familiar to most of you. The omnidirectional microphone on the left picks up equally well in all directions. The cardioid mic in the center gets its name from its heart-shaped directional pattern, and it's sensitive in the front and insensitive in the rear. And finally, the figure eight microphone is equally sensitive front and rear, but it's insensitive on either side. So let's look at the most common purest stereo microphone technique. Now I'm not going to get into multi-miking. Uh, as Alton Brown says on Good Eats, that's another show. Uh, so we're just going to talk about uh, purest simple miking techniques mainly used for classical music. The oldest form of stereophonic recording was invented by Alan Blumline around 1929. And Blumline stereo consists of a pair of figure eight microphones, one on top of each other at a 90 degree angle. <clears throat> it's also called pure coincidence stereo and sometimes intensity stereo because the stereo image is made up primarily of differences in intensity or volume between the two channels. The phase differences, there are some, but they're minimal. <clears throat> The microphone on the left is the AKG C24 Blumline Stereo Microphone. It's one of the most famous microphones of this type. Sheffield Labs direct-to-disc recordings from the late 1970s were made with pure coincident miking, including this recording of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet conducted by Eric Leinsdorf. Now the phase scope shows the entire orchestra in full flood in the finale to Act Two. And the excellent, excellent phase coherence between the two channels produces an elliptical lissajou pattern. Now, related to pure coincident recording is what we call near coincident, which is also known as ORTF stereo recording because it was developed by French national radio and television. And <clears throat> what we have here is two cardioid microphones spaced 17 centimeters apart and angled at 110 degrees. This is a Sheps MSTC64 ORTF microphone. Its predecessor was the MSTC54. Uh, I used these microphones for many, many years at the Crane School of Music. It's really an excellent microphone. <clears throat> Here's a comparison of pure uh, coincident Blumline recording to near coincident ORTF recording. Now that Sheffield recording of Romeo and Juliet is on the left. And a recording of Britain's War Requiem, which I did at Crane a few years ago, is on the right. And this was a section where all hell breaks loose in the DAC array uh, of that piece. Now, the slight separation of the cardioid capsules produces greater phase differences with ORTF than it does with pure coincident recording. And that's why the ellipse on the right is a little bit wider than it is with the pure coincident recording on the left. Here are three... Uh, ORTF shots in rapid succession. This is during the conclusion of Orff's Carmina Burana, which I also recorded a few years ago. And they all show excellent phase coherence between the left and right channels. But if you compare those three ORTF shots to the Sheffield Blumline recording in the lower left, the Blumline recording has a slightly narrower ellipse, again, again indicating that with pure Blumline recording, we have most of the stereo image made up by intensity differences and not so much with phase. Now there are some engineers who prefer to record with a pair of spaced omnidirectional microphones and this gives a very spacious 
stereo uh, presentation and a lot of hall ambience. Now the microphones are typically around six feet apart, but of course that can vary from one situation to the next. The trade-off with this type of recording is that it doesn't have the precision of imaging and soundstage localization that you find with coincident recording. The stereo picture is more generalized. Uh, Eliyahu Enbal's recording of Mahler's Fourth Symphony on Denon was made with a pair of B&K 4006 Omnis, and the circular Lissajous pattern shows considerable phase and amplitude differences. Most of you are probably uh, familiar with the work of engineer C. Robert Fine. He's famous for his Mercury Living Presence recordings that were made with three spaced omnidirectional microphones. And you can see the three microphones in this photo on the, le on the right. Uh, I've got little red arrows uh, that point to the three to make them a little bit clearer. Uh, this is one of Antal Doherty's sessions for Mercury with the London Symphony Orchestra. And I want to thank Tom Fine for allowing me to use this photograph. <clears throat> The center microphone provides the anchor for the overall uh, perspective and balance, and then the left and right side microphones create the stereo image. And I'm told by Tom that his father and his assistant engineer, Bob Eberentz, called these left and right side microphones. They did not call them outriggers or other things of that nature. So just a, a point of clarification there. Now, with careful microphone placement, this method can combine the spaciousness that you get with two omnis with a great deal of the precision of localization that you get with coincident recording. Okay, here are three phase shots of a recording made with three spaced omnis. This is a different uh, Mercury recording. This is during the conclusion of Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra with the entire orchestra playing full tilt. Now the patterns are fairly circular, and if you watch them on a scope while a piece is playing, you can see that they move a bit from side to side, and they do reflect considerable phase and amplitude differences. Now for those of you who, for those people who live in a monaural world, you might look at some of these and say, you know, my God, look at that phase, it's all over the place, and I have heard comments like that. Well, there's nothing wrong with any of these Lissajous patterns, they are all a function of the microphone techniques used to produce the stereo image. And for those who might be tempted to use a phase corrector to fix recordings like these, I think we should take a look and see what happens when we try to do just that. <coughs> now for these comparisons, I've picked some excerpts that show various instruments of the orchestra in different parts of the soundstage. And I think it's better to show the effect that phase correctors have on soundstage size and localization by picking a recording like this with a lot of solo instruments in various parts of the image, rather than an entire orchestra playing full tilt. I'm going to play short excerpts, about 30 seconds each, from three recordings. The Denon Mahler recording made with two spaced omnis, a Mercury Living Presence with three spaced omnis, <clears throat> and the Sheffield Prokofiev recording made with a pure coincident Blumline stereo microphone. Let me just make one comment about uh, these screen captures with the Adobe Audition phase scope. One of the really neat things about the Adobe Audition phase scope is that you don't actually have to be playing the file to capture an image. You can put the cursor anywhere in the file and the scope will give you the display at that instant in time without playing the file. So for the purposes of uh, demonstration like this, it works, uh, it's pretty handy. So we'll start with the Denon Mahler made with two spaced omnis. And for each of these demonstrations, I've captured a phase shot in three different places. Now the exact time and location uh, is shown right up on top of the three columns. And the scope shots in the top row are the original unprocessed versions. In the middle row, it's after processing with the Adobe Audition phase correction. And the bottom row is after processing with the Cedar Cambridge version eight phase corrector. I want to thank Seth for running these examples through his Cedar phase corrector, which, which I don't have. So this is the first example from the Denon Mahler recording in the first movement. And what Seth and I both, both noticed is that the phase correctors don't seem to know what to do with random phase produced by spaced microphones. In order to bring the two channels into uh, some kind of clo uh, closer phase relationship, what the phase corrector tries to do is find some common ground between the two channels, and there just isn't very much with, face, uh, with spaced microphones. And again, this is not a defect. This is what the recording engineer intended. <clears throat> 
Now the second vertical row of scope shots shows both phase correctors pulling it in a bit closer, but the others are really just different. They're not really better or worse. So here are the three versions, the original, then process with Adobe Audition, and finally with Cedar. And we'll just play them in succession. Again, on this system, I don't know how much you'll be able to hear, but tracks five through seven, please. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> On a high-end system, you might hear slight changes in the locations of the instruments and a possible slight narrowing of the soundstage with the phase correctors. It's pretty subtle. I notice here that on this Macintosh computer that the annotations on the left-hand side here didn't, aren't positioned properly. Again, the three across the top are the original unprocessed version in the middle with the Adobe Audition phase corrector and on the bottom with the cedar phase corrector, but somehow that doesn't display right on this computer. All right, to show three spaced omnis, I picked a different Mercury Living Presence recording than before. This time, Respighi's The Birds with Antal Doherty and the London Symphony, which has lots of solo instruments in various parts of the soundstage. Now, again, the random nature of the phase with spaced microphones doesn't give the phase correctors much to lock onto. And the process versions are slightly different than the original, but they're not necessarily better or worse. So here are the three versions. Again, the original with Adobe, Aud and, uh, the original first, then with the Adobe Audition phase corrector, and finally with the Cedar phase corrector. So tracks eight through 10. On a high-end system, uh, sitting in the, in the sweet spot, the soundstage on this one is n uh, narrowed a bit, and the localization is a bit less precise. Whether you could hear that here or not, I'm not sure. 
Okay, finally, let's look at Sheffield's Romeo and Juliet. John. No, no, I do not. And I'll say something about that shortly. All right, finally, let's look at Sheffield's Romeo and Juliet recording to see the effect on a recording made with pure coincident miking. Now, I took this excerpt off the Sheffield CD, which was actually made from their analog backup tapes. And the reason I did that is so that record groove noise wouldn't distort the scope patterns. All right, the first two shots of the original show excellent phase coherence between the two channels. Now, the third vertical column on the right it shows a more random phase pattern at that instant in time, and this can happen with cross-figure eight microphones when hall reflections are picked up from the rear. Now, if you look really closely, you can see that the Adobe Audition phase corrector, the, the, the line across the middle, the ones in the middle, uh, it narrows the pattern very slightly for the first two, but not so much with the third one. The cedar phase corrector across the bottom has the greatest effect uh, in the first and last ones, uh, especially. So let's hear the examples. First, uh, again, the original, then the Adobe Audition, and then finally cedar phase corrector, tracks 11 through 13. <laughs> Now, on my home system, and before I move away from that, on my home system, it's on this example that I hear the greatest differences, and really, the greatest amount of degradation by the phase correctors, especially the cedar, because it's, it's a bit more effective than the one that I use, the Adobe Audition. The soundstage is slightly narrower, and the localization is a bit less precise. And what the phase correctors have done is that they've taken a recording with excellent phase coherence and they've reduced the very subtle but crucial phase cues that give this recording its really exceptional sound staging. So what conclusions can we draw from all of this? Well, first of all, the benefits of phase correction for stereo transfers of monaural recordings are obvious, and since you can get the Adobe Audition 3.0 phase corrector for free, at least most people should be able to uh, give it a try. Uh, there's no excuse not to use it, at least not to try it. But stereophonic recordings rely on phase and amplitude differences to create the stereo soundstage, and the Lissajou patterns that you see on stereophonic recordings are not a defect. And any attempts to alter the phase relationships between the two channels risks changing the stereo perspective that the original engineer captured. Again, I didn't get into recordings made with multiple microphones, but they are rarely phase coherent. But uh, as in the case with the others, any attempts at phase correction will alter the perspective created by the original recording engineer. You may or may not like what the original engineer did, but if you run it through a phase corrector, you're going to change the original intent. <clears throat> now, when I was preparing this paper, <clears throat> uh, I had made some, I had some email correspondence with Gordon Reed, who was the managing director at Cedar. Uh, 
And he said that the cedar phase corrector could be used on stereo recordings, but he also noted that it was intended to correct phase defects and not phase differences between the two channels. And changing the stereo perspective uh, on a recording was not Cedar's intention. I'd like to make a final but very important point. On stereophonic material, it's very difficult for the phase correctors to tell the difference between phase defects caused by azimuth errors and so forth and phase differences created by the microphone placement. So if you're doing sloppy head alignment, don't think you can rely on the phase corrector to fix it for you. You've got to get the playback right first. And especially on a stereo recording, once you get the playback right, you don't want to do anything else to, to mess it up. And of course, I don't really need to say this. I'm sure most of you already uh, agree with this. But no matter what kind of processing you do, you have to listen before and after on a high resolution system with good soundstage reproduction to make sure that you haven't degraded what the engineer worked really hard to achieve. My personal opinion is with stereo recordings and phase correctors, uh, proceed with caution or possibly not at all. So that's the conclusion of that part. Any questions? John. All right, we're, we're often stuck dealing with live recordings, right? right? Not these wonderfully engineered things. And in, in live recordings, you know, the mic placement is often catch as catch can. If, if it's recorded out of the audience or even, even a hall recording, it, it's not always a good mic placement. And so when you're dealing with one of those recordings, you occasionally do have the sense that the, the phase is way off between the channels. And if you, you want to play with it, I found that if it's a recording of something like a piano concerto, you can, the, the piano will be in the, mostly recorded in the center. It's not exactly mono, but it's a lot more mono than the rest of it. Right. And so you can, you can actually look at that to, to see if you want to line up something that's in the center, if you follow what I mean. Yeah, the, I follow. The, the utility yeah. of all this, I, the, the, that was an interesting exercise, but it doesn't have a lot of utility. It, it generally, what you're doing is just ruining recordings when you do that. But there's a time when you, when you need it, right? When, when you've got funky live recordings that are stereo. Well, and, and they're I, I, whether live, I, I don't know that I agree that live recordings are catch as catch can, particularly if you've got an engineer that works in a hall with an orchestra regularly. I think, you know, uh, uh, the engineers are going to be pretty familiar with that right. space and their equipment and but, probably have a system down to do it, to do it very well. I know there are situations where, uh, you know, you go into a hall you've never been in before, you've got very little setup time, and you may not get it right the first time. Uh, yeah, you're, you're presuming a, a, a decent job of recording. I'm talking about something way down the I, scale. I'm presuming at least being able to go to a rehearsal, fiddle with your microphone placement, and, and put them in the best possible place. Uh, obviously, if you've had no time to do that and you're flying by the seat of your pants, which uh, we've all had to do from time to time, you know, it may be a different situation. Uh, again, the use of a phase corrector, uh, you have to listen because, you know, you might make it better, you might make it worse, and you have to make that judgment. Yeah, I agree with that totally. Have you looked, have you looked into the shuffling arrangements in the original Blumline patents, which is deliberately introduces a interchannel crossfeed right. uh, that will make Lissajou patterns more circular uh, right, when, it's it used, when it's used properly. So that's part of the original Blumline patent. So uh, uh, you speak of phase coherence as something that is, uh, uh, the way you've used the phrase phase coherence as, it, it implies that it's something that's good. It may not necessarily be good. It's just something that happens right. when you use a, uh, a coincident technique. And of course, if you use it the way Blumline intended, it's not going to be coincident completely, particularly at the, uh, after the shelf of the shuffler kicks in at lower frequencies. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is that lesser shoe patterns, due to the rolled off frequency spectrum of most classical music, tend to emphasize what's going on at lower frequencies. So uh, in, in a, say, full orchestra passage, you're not going to see in a lesser shoe pattern, unless it's very simple, in, in a full orchestra passage, you're going to see what's happening at the lower frequencies because it's going to be all over the screen. What's happening at higher frequencies 
is going to be submerged visually uh, and dominated by what's happening at low frequencies. And uh, only coincident techniques will sort of uh, monoize the low frequencies enough to have any kind of coherence at all. Uh, so lesser dual patterns should not be used as a gauge of particularly anything other than what they were used for in the old days, uh, estimating uh, whether your, your uh, cunning size is going to jump out of the groove or not. I um, certainly agree that you can't use a Lissajou pattern alone as, an arbit as, as a, to, a way to pass judgment on the final result. And as I've already said, you have to listen. But the Lissajou patterns, I think, are useful here for the purposes of illustration. Yes, for and again, if an engineer does use a coincident microphone technique and use a shuffler on it, again, we, we have to hope that the engineer in using the shuffler exercised good judgment and got something that was better rather than worse than the coincident mic without the shuffler. Well, uh, in, in Bloodline's theory indicates that the shuffler is, absolute, is necessary, absolutely necessary, uh, because he knew that the ears are not coincident at low frequencies. So uh, to get anything to sound right at all, you have to have some interaural phase and uh, time, uh, level differences at low frequencies. Well, that, uh, there are a lot of Blumline recordings that have been made without a shuffler. And yeah, doesn't mean, that, that, means, that doesn't mean they were correct, that they, are, they couldn't have been made better with a shuffler. Well, you know, that's, that's a, uh, certainly a subjective thing. Uh, again, the final result, uh, if the engineer, you know, achieves something really good in the final result, however it was done, I think we have to exercise caution before we mess with it. I totally agree with that. Other questions? Anyone else? Okay, give us about five minutes to regroup here and get the next slideshow up and we'll take it from there. Here we go with part two. This is a real intriguing uh, subject because, of course, this has to deal with real audio restoration of, not in the analog domain, but of very early digital processes, namely the Sony PCM F1 audio tapes that, start, that were created in 1981. These were the predecessors of DATS, if I'm correct, in a certain yes, way. Sort of, yeah. Right. And I'm not going to go into all of what the, all the bells and whistles about it is, because Gary is going to explain it, and there are many traps concerning trying to retrieve anything that was originally recorded on it due to the fact of the sampling rate and also the shortcomings of the machines that played them back, which was one of the biggest problems. Uh, this, pro um, excuse me, this program that you're going to hear now uh, is an expanded version of a presentation that Gary's going to give in a, a little less than a month from now down in Baltimore. So we're getting a real treat here of really getting the uh, nuts and bolts concerning what goes on with the Sony PCM-1. Yeah, when I get back home, this is actually probably a time and a half of what I'm going to have time to do in Baltimore. And when I get home this weekend, then I have to decide what to cut. So. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the old Sony PCMF1 digital recording system? Good. Well, then most of you probably know it was a digital recording processor that was introduced by Sony in 1981. And what the PCMF1 processor did was it encoded the digital data stream on a video carrier and stored the data on videotape. And this was fairly common for early digital recording systems because videotape recorders had about four times the bandwidth you needed for digital audio recording. And so a lot of uh, digital audio processor manufacturers used videotape as the storage. Now for the F1 system, you could use either Sony's beta format or J JVC's competing VHS system. I've even heard of a couple of cases where people use three-quarter inch U-Matic tapes with a PCMF1 recorder. I don't think that's very common, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it. Of course, Sony preferred the beta format, and there was good reason other than just making a, a profit because beta was a technically superior system to VHS. Sony actually made two versions of the PCMF1 for NTSC and PAL video systems. Now, it's been nearly decades since most users made recordings on a PCMF1, 
And because the formats for digital audio were not yet standardized, transferring these old digital tapes to current digital standards is not completely straightforward, and that's what we're going to explore tonight. But first, I'd like to give you a little background that will show why the PCMF1 generated so much interest when it was first introduced. The physical size of digital recording systems had been reduced considerably since the first digital audio recorders appeared in the early 1970s. In the photo on the left, the equipment on the very left is Denon's DN023R digital recording system from 1972. It was literally a truckload of equipment, as you can see. A later and smaller system is shown on the right. And storage for the, these Denon recording systems was on two-inch reel-to-reel videotape, very cumbersome and not very easily edited. Denon's original recording system was 13 bits. They later made a 14-bit system, and by adding treble pre-emphasis, which I'll talk about a little bit later, they were able to extend the high-frequency resolution to about 15 and a half bits. In the mid-1970s, Dr. Thomas Stockham developed the first version of his Soundstream digital recorder, which was originally 16 bits, but the first version had a 37.5 kilohertz sampling rate. By 1978, and this was at Telarc's suggestion, he had increased the sampling rate to 50 kilohertz, and in April of that year, his improved Soundstream recorder was used for the first Telarc digital recording. And that was, of course, the famous Cleveland Symphonic Winds recording conducted by Frederick Fennell with what engineer Jack Renner called the bass drum heard round the world. Now, this photo uh, of Stockham with his uh, digital recording system was taken at the first sessions for Telarc. And Stockham's recording system was a hand-built digital processor, which you can see the processor uh, on the left here and a, a close-up version of it from one of uh, Soundstream's publicity photos on the, uh, in the larger uh, illustration. And on the right in this illustration was a Honeywell instrumentation recorder that Stockham had modified, especially to suit his specific requirements for his digital recording system. Now, you can see that Stockham's recording system was a bit smaller, and actually it was quite a bit smaller than Denon's, but it was still uh, a ways from being portable. And you can see the big road cases on the bottom that he used to haul all this equipment around. The PCMF1 was a real breakthrough in both portability and price. The processor sold for under $2,000, and it was designed to be stacked with Sony's SL2000 portable beta recorder. Nakamichi also sold their own version of the PCMF1 processor under license from Sony, and this was the DMP100, which is shown on the bottom. Now, physically, it was identical to the Sony PCMF1, except for the color scheme. This is the Nakamichi brochure for the DMP100, and in the wide by Nakamichi column on the right, they note careful attention to the quality of the analog circuitry, the electrolytic capacitors with superior dissipation factor and lower distortion than tantalum types, and they also guaranteed harmonic distortion, frequency response, and dynamic range specifications for the digital portion of the processor. A to D converters and D to A converters back in those days could vary considerably from one sample to the next, and what Nakamichi did, uh, as I understand it, is that they basically hand-selected the processors to get something close to 16-bit performance out of each unit that came off the assembly line. Now, each DMP100 came with an individual performance data sheet with measurements on that individual unit, and this is a sheet that came with the one that we purchased at the Crane School of Music in 1984. The dynamic range for this unit is just over 92 dB for each channel, and that indicates a resolution of about 15.4 bits. Now, theoretically, a 16-bit sh system should, real, should yield 96 dB of dynamic range, but back then, even the best converters fell, sh fell short of that. And the thing is, if you bought a Sony PCMF1 processor, there might be certain units that would, that would perform as, as well as the Nakamichi, at least on the digital end. The analog circuitry, of course, wouldn't be as good, but the sample-to-sample -sample variations of the converters would, could vary quite a bit and Nakamichi guaranteed that they would all meet a certain minimal performance requirement. I couldn't resist putting this photo up. This is a rather amusing photo from the Sony brochure for the PCMF1. 
The SL2000 beta recorder was a top-loading machine, and obviously the marketing people didn't know that if you stacked the processor on top of the beta recorder, there was no way to get the tape in and out of the machine. Uh, with my photo editor, I reversed the two for the, the, the picture that you saw uh, earlier. I got a big kick out of that one. There are four issues that need to be dealt with to transfer PCMF tapes to modern digital standards. And I'm going to talk about each one in more detail shortly, but here's an overview. First of all, the sampling rate was 44.056 kilohertz. And these days, and for quite a long time now, sampling rates are always at multiples of either 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. Now, I have to mention that 44.056 kilohertz only applies to recordings made on NTSC-based video systems. The sample rate for PC PAL systems was 44.1. So if you have tapes that were made on a PAL system and you have a PAL processor and PAL video playback machine, you don't need to worry about the sampling rate. Basically, the sampling frequency had to be wedged between two harmonics of the power line frequency, which of course determines the vertical rate. And that's 50 hertz on PAL systems and 60 hertz in NTSC countries. And that's the reason for the two different sample rates. Uh, the second thing is that all PCMF1 recordings were made with high frequency pre-emphasis, which is a high frequency boost that's applied during the recording process. Now the PCM F1 followed the 50 microsecond, 15 microsecond curve that would become part of the Red Book specification for the compact disc uh, only a year later. The third issue is that the two channels are not in phase. There is an interchannel time delay that needs to be corrected. PCM F1 tapes also have DC offset and that also needs to be corrected. There is one big problem with the PCMF1 processor and the Nakamichi uh, version of it. The processor did not have a digital output. In fact, when the, this processor was introduced in 1981, the SPDIF digital interface had not even been standardized at that point, didn't exist. So there was no digital output on it. And the only way to transfer these tapes to a new format using the original processor is to use the analog outputs feed them to the analog inputs of another digital recording system. And of course, this is not acceptable because even uh, because it adds two unnecessary conversion processes, which you really don't want to do. And even if you have excellent converters in your digital recorder, you're still saddled with the limitations of the F1's D to A converters and analog circuitry. So you really don't want to do that. What you need is a later Sony processor with an SPDIF digital output. And the one that's shown in this picture is a PCM 601 ESD. This was the first F1 compatible digital processor that had an SPDIF output. Some people have told me it was the only one they made with an SPDIF digital output. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it was certainly the first one. It looks very similar to the earlier PCM 501, except for the addition of the SPDIF uh, output on the rear panel. These do turn up on eBay not very often. You have to keep looking. I looked for years before I finally found one for a reasonable price, and this, these pictures are of the one that I bought. This is the recorder that I use for my own transfer work. This is a Tascam DA3000. Now, it has to be one of the best buys in audio today. The list price on this Tascam recorder is $1,000, but these days there are quite a few dealers that are selling it for less than $800. I've got two of them in my studio at school and one uh, in, in my system at home. The DA3000 has no moving parts. It uses SD memory cards for storage, and it records PCM up to 192 kilohertz, 24-bit, and it also does direct stream digital, which won't be particularly useful for this application, but <coughs> if you wish to do that, it'll do it. It has a built-in switchable sample rate converter, which is based on the Cirrus Logic CS8422 sample rate converter chip. <clears throat> now, the sample rate converter chip is, is pretty interesting because it also does red book de-emphasis. But very strangely, this feature is entirely undocumented by, by Tascam. There's absolutely no mention of it in the owner's manual, and I'm going to talk more on that shortly. If you're using a DA3000 to transfer your PCMF1 tapes, <coughs> these are the settings that you need, the critical settings in, uh, in the setup menu. First of all, you need to turn the sample rate converter to on. 
<clears throat> Second thing, you should, you should uh, select Wave 24 uh, under File for 24-bit uh, uh, PCM uh, Wave files. And finally, you should set the sample rate to 88.2 kilohertz. And I'm going to explain uh, a bit later why I convert to 88.2 rather than 44.1. <clears throat> I recommend converting the 14 or 16-bit data streams on your F1 tapes to 24-bit, which will make any signal processing you do on your editor <coughs> much more accurate. Now let's talk about the Red Book pre-emphasis and, and de-emphasis standard. Now the so-called Red Book was the Sony Philips document that contained all of the standards for the compact disc. And the standard that they specified for pre-emphasis had already been in use when the CD was introduced in 1982. High frequency pre-emphasis on compact discs was an option in the Red Book standard, and actually not very many manufacturers implemented it, but you could if you wanted to. Basically, pre-emphasis is a high frequency boost that's applied during the record process. And the pre-emphasis curve, which I've shown in this graph here, uh, is defined by two time constants, 50 microseconds and 15 microseconds. F the 50 microsecond part of it corresponds to 3.183 kilohertz, which is where the high frequency boost begins. And in record, the filter response is 3 dB up at this frequency and playback it's 3 dB down. The 15 microsecond part of it refers to the point where the high frequency boost is shelved. And this takes place at 10.610 kilohertz. The playback de-emphasis, which is complementary, is shown uh, in the blue line on this graph. Now, when pre-emphasis was first conceived for digital recording, most converters were 14-bit. And those of you that remember the early history of the compact disc, Sony and Philips decided very late in the game before the introduction of the CD to make it a 16-bit format. The CD came perilously close to becoming a 14-bit uh, format. Uh, which is kind of a scary thing from where we sit today. The pre-emphasis was applied with an analog filter before the A to D conversion took place, and it was used to overcome the low-level, high-frequency linearity problems that were inherent in the A to D and D to A converters of the day, and basically extend the resolution of those converters beyond, the four, beyond 14 bits at high frequencies. Now, in the early digital recordings, the playback de-emphasis was also done with an analog filter after the D to A conversion. And since the introduction of 24-bit converters, playback de-emphasis on older recordings has normally been applied in the digital domain. Usually, it's in the digital filter just ahead of the D to A conversion, conversion process. But it can be applied elsewhere, and that's what we're going to see shortly. Uh, although a lot of early digital recorders used pre-emphasis, not very many CD manufacturers adopted it. Uh, I have a bunch of CDs in my collection from the early days which have pre-emphasis. They're all made in Japan by Denon. By 1990 or so, the converters had improved to the point where most manufacturers thought that pre-emphasis was no longer necessary and the handful of CD manufacturers that had used it stopped doing so. But I think you'll find in your collections, if you do have CDs that have pre-emphasis on them, they were probably manufactured by Denon. Not very many other companies showed any interest in it. This is... I'm sorry? Ah, if you have an outboard uh, digital processor that has an emphasis light that comes on when you play a, a disc with pre-emphasis, that's the only way to tell. Or if you have a, a player that won't do de-emphasis, it's going to sound too bright. But uh, if you have a converter with a light on it, uh, that's how you can tell. Uh, okay, here is the front page. No, here's the block. No, let me see. Let me back up again. I lost my place. All right. This is an inside view of the Tascam DA3000 digital recorder. This is from the Tascam website. And Tascam seems very proud of all of the parts that are used in, uh, the, on the main PC board, including the, very, the really excellent Burr Brown analog to digital and D to A converter chips. But they don't point out the Cirrus Logic CS8422 sample rate converter chip, which is on a little input board uh, in the back. Uh, and I pointed it out with the, the red arrow here. Uh, 
You'll also know that they misspelled op amps. It says op amp instead, but uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. But they don't make a big deal about the sample rate converter at all. They don't even, they don't even indicate that it's there. This is the block diagram of the DA3000 recorder. Uh, and I've circled the CS8422 sample rate converter chip in red. Uh, you can see it here. And in the block diagram, uh, they note that the CS8422 incorporates the digital input receiver and the digital input switching. But there's no indication that this chip performs de-emphasis. But this is the front page of the CS8422 data sheet, which you can get on the Cirrus Logic website. And the data sheet clearly shows that the chip performs uh, de-emphasis. So the DA3000 recorder actually takes care of the first two issues, the sample rate conversion and the de-emphasis, right off the bat. And again, why Tascam fails to note that it will do the de-emphasis uh, is a mystery to me. I think they're, they might sell more of them if they let people know that. I know that some of you may prefer to record directly from your computer work, directly onto your computer workstations, so you'll need to put a sample rate converter between your PCM601 and your computer. Now, I know there are some people out there who will tell you that you can feed the 44.056 kilohertz data stream directly to your computer and do the sample rate conversion with software on your editor. I strongly advise against this because your computer's SPDIF input receiver will not achieve a proper digital lock. Most digital input receivers, in addition to uh, basically uh, locking onto the incoming data stream, also re-clock and help reduce clock jitter. And what happens in your typical input receiver these days is that at first, the input receiver throws a fairly wide window on the incoming data stream. And once it has determined that it is a standard sampling frequency, it closes that data window considerably, locks onto it, and that's the only way it can achieve a, 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 you know, effective clock jitter suppression. If the sampling frequency is off, if it's 44.056, it may work, but it'll never, it'll never, it'll never lock on completely, and it will never achieve a proper jit, uh, jitter reduction. So I really don't recommend doing that, even if you get sound through and it appears to work. Uh, not a good idea. Now, there aren't many outboard sample rate converters available anymore, unfortunately, but this is an example of a high-end converter. This is the Mitex Stereo 192 SRC, and the list price on this one is just under $1,200. It's actually more expensive than the Tascam recorder. You could, you know, if you bought the Tascam recorder uh, uh, and just used it as a sample rate converter, it's more cost effective. However, uh, this MyTech may actually perform better. They make very good equipment, and I have no doubt that it's probably worth what they charge for it. Now, this MyTech sample rate converter, like the CS8422 chip that's in the Tascam DA3000, is an asynchronous converter. And what that means is that it will accept any input sampling frequency from 32 kilohertz to 200 kilohertz. And this is really important. There are some high-end sample rate converters which will only convert standard sampling rates to other standard sampling rates. And they probably won't properly lock on to 44.056. What you need is an asynchronous converter in order to lock on to the non-standard sample rate. It's the same uh, kind of converter you need for variable speed applications. Now, if you're on a budget and you don't want to spend $1,200 on a sample rate converter, this $200 Behringer SRC2496 actually works very, very well. It uses a Cirrus Logic CS8420 sample rate converter chip. It's an earlier generation chip that only works up to 96 kilohertz, but that's fine for what we need to do here. The CS8420 is an asynchronous converter, so it will convert the incoming 44.056 data stream to 88.2. And it also has pretty flexible I.O. It has AES, EBU, SP, diff, and Toslink optical uh, inputs and outputs. But there's one thing that the Behringer uh, SRC2496 doesn't do. It doesn't perform de-emphasis, 
if you use it as a sample rate converter. If you use it as an A to D or as a D to A converter, excuse me, it will perform de-emphasis, but if you use it as a sample rate converter, it won't. It also, if you use it as a D to A converter, I simply use one as an indicator to see if there is, in fact, pre-emphasis on a CD to answer John's question. It has a light on the front panel that comes on if there's pre-emphasis on a disc. Uh, <clears throat> And I keep one around just for that so I can tell if a disc has pre-emphasis. So it doesn't cost a lot of money and it works surprisingly well. But there are other solutions to the de-emphasis issue. And, and this preset I'm showing here uh, is included with Isotope's Mastering e uh, Equalization. It's part of the Isotope Mastering Effects Bundle that comes with SoundForge 11 Pro and it also comes with the newer SoundForge 12 Pro that just came out about a month ago. The accuracy is pretty good. It's plus or minus uh, zero or 0 0.4 dB according to my measurements, which is, which is adequate. And it's probably no worse than the analog filters that created the pre-emphasis curve in the first place. Now I have frequency and level data <coughs> for the red book de-emphasis curve, which is based on a computer simulation that I did quite a long time ago. If you have equalization plugins uh, with your editor, which you probably do, and you'd like to experiment uh, creating your own de-emphasis curve, I can send you the raw data and you can see how well your results compare to, uh, uh, to what it's supposed to be. Just email me and I can send it to you. Okay, interchannel time delay. Now, like most other early digital recording systems, the PCMF1's analog to digital and digital to analog converter chips actually had one converter that switched back and forth between the two channels. Uh, and this caused a time delay between the two channels that was equal to half a sample at the sampling frequency. Now, the analog to digital and the digital to analog uh, converter delays were complementary. So there was no time delay at the analog outputs of the PCMF1 processor. But the analog converter, the analog to digital converter delay got recorded and it needs to be corrected if you're doing a digital transfer. You can calculate the inner channel time delay uh, pretty easily. The time delay is equal to the reciprocal of the sample rate divided by two. And if the sample rate is 44.056 kilohertz, uh, the inner channel time delay is 11.349 microseconds. And I think on the handout I indicated that I put, all, put these formulas down as well. Uh, if the sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz, the time delay is going to be 11.338 microseconds. The difference between those two is 0 0.011 microseconds. Uh, is that difference anything to get excited about? Well, we're gonna find out about that shortly. When I was uh, developing my own procedures for uh, transferring PCMF1 tapes, I recorded one kilohertz and 10 kilohertz test tones with my original F1 processor. And then I transferred them to the Tascam DA3000 recorder using the PCM601 processor. But rather than convert them to 44.1 kilohertz, as I indicated earlier, I set the DA3000's uh, sample rate converter chip to 88.2. Now, if you record a 10 kilohertz test tone with your original F1 processor and transfer it, you can see the delay between the two channels. And in this illustration up here, now that I've upsampled to 88.2, instead of the time delay being half a sample at the original sampling frequency, it's now, the time delay is one sample at 88.2 kilohertz. And what you can see here is here's the peak in the sine wave in the right channel. And you can see one sample later, the left channel is lagging behind. So we now have one sample at 88.2 instead of half a sample at the original sampling frequency. Now you have to remember that time moves from left to right in the editing window, so the left channel is actually behind the right channel. Now, I had someone ask me if this, was, if this inner channel time delay was audible. A rather uh, astonishing question in my view. The phase difference is 41 degrees, okay? And if you had an analog tape that had an azimuth error that was that bad, you would never let it go. Yes, it's audible, and yes, it has to be fixed. But someone did ask me that question. <clears throat> 
10 kilohertz. Would anybody in here aligning an analog tape let that go? No, thank you. Yeah, but you're aligning the whole frequency range and you're aligning an analog tape. I don't know about you guys, but when I align a, an analog tape, I use a 10 kilohertz tone on my alignment tape. And if it was 41 degrees off, I would fix it. Okay, where are we here? Uh, now, the PCMF1 analog to digital and di digital to analog converter chips. And I already talked about that. I need the next page here. Okay. So all we need to do here to get these channels in alignment is delete one sample in the left channel. And most digital editors can easily do this. Basically, the sample rate of your transfer must be at 88.2 kilohertz, as I mentioned already. Now, I don't know of any editors that will allow you to delete half a sample. One sample is normally the smallest division. So what I do is I highlight one channel, one sample in the left channel, and then I, at the beginning of the file, like you see here, and I simply hit the delete key once and only once. And once you hit the delete key, you can see the two channels are now perfectly in alignment. Now, if you really want to get picky, you can use a phase corrector to align the channels. And this is the phase corrector that uh, I've mentioned earlier in the first half of, 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 this, uh, of, of this evening that comes with Adobe Audition 3.0. And <clears throat> If you're going to do it this way, the sampling rate really can be either 44.1 or 88.2. What you have to do is you have to use the global time shift. And you set the left channel so that it's at minus 11.35 microseconds. There's a little window here where you actually set the time delay, where you actually type it in. And uh, Adobe Audition 3.0, the phase corrector, only allows two decimal places, so you have to round up 11.349, and I would not lose any sleep over that one thousandth of a microsecond uh, difference between the two. Rounding it up to uh, 11.35 is, is perfectly okay. Again, with the phase corrector, you have to do this manually. You cannot use the automatic phase correction. It won't work. <clears throat> and even if you can get it to work on test tones, once you start doing it with program material, the phase corrector has no idea what's the inner channel time delay and what's the phase difference between the microphones and all of that. So you've got to do this manually. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking that making the correct time conversion for half a sample at 44.056 kilohertz is probably more accurate than upsampling to 88.2 and deleting one sample. Well. In theory, that's true, but in reality, the difference, I think, is of little or no consequence. Now, the scope image on the left uh, shows the Lissajous pattern for the exact time correction using Adobe Audition's phase corrector. Now, the image on the right is a result of deleting one sample at 88.2 kilohertz. Again, this is with a, a 10 kilohertz test tone. Uh, <clears throat> in reality, both of them look uh, excellent, and the phase difference between the two is only 0 0.04 degrees. In other words, that's the error using the method on, on the right, deleting one sample at 88.2. On the handout, I put an on, a, a link to an online calculator where if you know the time difference, it'll tell you what the phase difference is at any frequency you care to enter. The bottom line here is that this is a minuscule difference. Both of these look, you know, really good, and I wouldn't get too excited about the difference between them. I think either way you correct the internet inner channel time delay, using the exact uh, correction with a phase corrector or just deleting one sample at 88.2 in the left channel, either way, I think it's fine. Okay, DC offset. I'd like to talk about DC offset for a few minutes exactly what it is and why getting rid of it is important. This here is a typical amplification stage using an IC op amp, uh, which is the way a lot of audio circuits are designed these days. And this is an op amp powered by dual uh, power supply rails. In this case, we have plus and minus 15 volts powering this op amp. This is a non-inverting circuit, meaning the polarity of the output is the same as the input. And uh, the gain is, is uh, the voltage gain is calculated using the formula that's shown here. It's R1 over R2 plus 1. And in this particular il uh, illustration, 
This circuit is configured for a voltage gain of 10, which is also a gain of 20 dB. Now, ideally, the input and output of any amplification stage should be at exactly zero volts DC, which is midway between the positive and negative power supply rails. In other words, the zero crossing for the audio signal should be at exactly zero volts. Unfortunately, real-world amplification circuits do produce some DC offset. And this causes the output zero crossing to be above or below zero volts DC. And in this particular example, I've raised it so it's slightly above zero volts uh, DC. Now, if the DC offset is confined to one stage, it may only be a few millivolts, and it's not going to be of much consequence. And usually, if it's less than 10 millivolts, we don't worry about it too much. There's no uh, cause for concern. But one of the problems with DC offset is that they can be, the offsets can be cumulative. And in this slide, the DC offset from a previous stage appears at the input. And what happens is the offset gets amplified along with the audio according to the gain of the amplifier. And if the input offset is a mere 10 millivolts and you have a circuit configured for a voltage gain of 10, the offset at the output is going to be 100 millivolts. And now it's at a level where it can be problematic. Now, the most common way to get rid of DC offsets is with coupling capacitors. And coupling capacitors will pass the audio or, or the AC component of the signal and, and block the DC. And this example shows input and output coupling capacitors added to the amplifier to keep the input and output levels at zero volts DC. But the thing is, in high-end applications, we try to keep the number of, uh, of coupling capacitors to a minimum because eventually they leave a sonic imprint, especially if they're not very high-grade capacitors, which in a lot of uh, equipment, that's the case. There are also other uh, methods of eliminating DC offsets. One of them is using DC servos, which I happen to be a big fan of, or designing circuits with inherently low levels of offset. But again, that's a, a, a subject that would require a presentation by itself, and we don't have time to get into that tonight. Now, a coupling capacitor and its load basically form a high-pass filter. And in order to avoid affecting the low end of the audio spectrum, the time constants of these resistor capacitor networks are usually set to keep the low frequency roll off well below the audible range. And in this particular example, the minus 3 dB point for the filter is set at 1 hertz. And if you have too many coupling capacitors, the cumulative effect of multiple low frequency roll offs can become problematic. So why do we care about DC offsets? Well, one important reason is to maximize headroom. What you see on the left is a sine wave with, uh, uh, at maximum signal level before clipping with a zero crossing at exactly zero volts DC. Now, th this would be a level of zero dBFS or zero dB full scale. Now, in the middle, the level has exceeded zero dBFS. And so the waveform has been driven into clipping. And you'll notice that with the zero crossing at exactly zero volts DC, the clipping is symmetrical. The positive and the negative uh, uh, peaks clip at, a, at the same time and at the same rate. But on the right here, we have a situation where DC offset causes the clipping to be asymmetrical. And since the, the offset is well above, or since the, 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 the uh, zero crossing is well above zero volts DC, uh, what happens is the positive going portion of the waveform clips before the negative going portion. And this reduces headroom because you've clipped here and all of this space down here is wasted. So the negative peak well below clipping and uh, our headroom can be substantially reduced. <clears throat> and the other thing is that if high levels of DC offset reach your loudspeakers, you can destroy them. Normally, it's not serious enough to cause that problem, but I know of instances where it has been. <clears throat> well, DC offset was a known problem with early A to D and D to A converters, so manufacturers took steps to ensure that offset levels would be kept to a minimum. Now, the Sony PCMF1, if you look at the service manual, it had trim adjustments for DC offset for both the A to D and the D to A converters. 
and the alignment instructions for the F1 in the service manual indicate that the offset should be trimmed to 10 millivolts or less. Now, 10 millivolts is not dangerously high or even enough to seriously compromise headroom. And if you use your, FM, your F1 processor to play back your tapes, the coupling capacitors in the analog playback circuitry will get rid of any offset and prevent them from reaching the, uh, the analog outputs. But if you're making a digital transfer, <clears throat> offset can cause audible low-level clicks if the offsets come and go, which at the very least is annoying. So we need to get rid of them. Now, how do you know that your old F1 digital tapes have DC offset? When I first got into transferring uh, my, some of my PCM F1 tapes, other people that had done this had told me about a couple of the issues, the sample rate, the pre-emphasis, uh, and I think, uh, I think some of the other things, but no one had mentioned to me that there was a DC offset problem. It's something I discovered on my own. And here's, what, here's, how, here's how I found it. When I uh, was looking at one of my transferred recordings on my editor, I noticed that during the silent passage in the music where there's supposed to be nothing but you know, hall ambience and, or you know, room noise and the room tone in the background, that my meters were un unusually high. So I zoomed in vertically and I saw what the problem was, DC offset. You can see the zero crossing in the left channel is actually below where it should be and in the right channel it's actually a bit too high. It's in positive DC t territory. So that's how I accidentally discovered it. No one had mentioned this to me. So how do we get rid of it? Well, most digital editors actually provide a means of removing DC offsets. SoundForge gives you the option of uh, automatically removing it, or you can move it by a specified number of quantization levels. You can adjust it manually. I find the automatic setting works just fine. Now the illustration in the lower right shows the same level of vertical zoom as before. Uh, we can go back to the previous slide. You can see here we've got a negative offset in the left channel, positive in the right, and now by removing it, the zero crossing is at zero volts DC, exactly where uh, it's supposed to be, and the meters are now reading just the ambient noise in the room instead of reading high DC offset levels. So it's really pretty simple to get rid of. If you don't have SoundForge or for some reason your editor doesn't have a DC offset option, which is unlikely, but there are other options. Uh, there are some free ones that, that will do the trick. Adobe Audition and the free Audacity editing programs both have DC offset removal options in the normalize window. And I've tried them, they both work fine. Again, I talked about Adobe Audition and about getting a free version, which may or may not work, but it's worth a try. You could also eliminate DC offset by creating a high pass filter in one of your equalization plugins. Here's the problem I found. None of the equalization modules that I have allow you to create a high, high pass filter with a corner frequency below 20 hertz. 20 hertz is as low as any of mine go. And in order to minimize any impact on the audio, you really should set it to one hertz or lower. Even a tenth of a hertz would be better. If you can do this, great. But if your editor doesn't have a DC offset removal tool, the most, sensitive, uh, most sensible option is to use one of these free programs. They work very, very well. Okay, if you're just getting started doing transfers of PCM F1 tapes, I have a couple of suggestions that will help you verify that your procedures are working properly. First of all, I suggest recording a one kilohertz and a 10 kilohertz test tone, sine waves, using your original F1 processor. Just a few minutes at each frequency will be fine. And you can do this at the end of one of your old uh, beta tapes, or you can do it with a new tape. I bought, a few, I, I bought a few new beta tapes on eBay last year that were still in the shrink wrap and they work just fine. What you do is you set the level on your one kilohertz tone to minus 10 dBFS on the F1 processor. You don't change the level for the 10 kilohertz tone. The F1 processor's meters are going to read minus 2.4 dBFS when you put the 10 kilohertz tone in at the same level because the metering on the processor reflects the pre-emphasis. It has to. So you, so that you know that you're not saturating the tape at high frequencies or driving the digital converters into clipping, I guess is what I really ought to say. Uh, now, after you've recorded the tones, you can change the processor to your PCM601 
and you can transfer the test tomes through a sample rate converter to your digital recorder or directly to your computer. And then you can use the test tones to verify that the de-emphasis and the interchannel time alignment are being done correctly, the same way that I did for the illustrations in the slideshow. Uh, a few final thoughts. I think that what you'll find is that your PCMF1 recordings that you made uh, 35 years ago sound a lot better than you had originally thought. And by bypassing the old D to A converters and analog circuitry in the F1 processor and doing the playback conversion with the equipment that we have today, you eliminate a, a serious limitation in the old PCMF1 system. The biggest problem, of course, is going to be keeping your old SL2000 beta machine in working condition or whichever beta machine you happen to use. Uh, fortunately, the SL2000 I used back in the 1980s is still working and working quite well. You need to pay very close attention to the tracking adjustment. If you have dropout problems, the first thing to check is tracking on your beta machine. And you can use the tracking meter on the PCM601 processor to make sure that your tracking is set correctly. Now, when I made my F1 recordings back in the 1980s, the playback tracking adjustment on my SL2000 beta recorder was dead center. Now on the exact same machine, it's a little bit off. We have to remember <clears throat> that the tracking adjustment actually changes the speed of the tape. And if the speed is off, the processor won't lock onto the horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical rates of the video carrier. And you may need to readjust the tracking partway through the tape. These beta machines, you have to remember, are really, really old. And they may not maintain constant speed from beginning to the end of the tape uh, anymore. So if you find half the tape is playing fine and you get a little further along and it starts dropping out, try readjusting the tracking. It may, it may do the trick. Sony also made two auto tracking beta machines near the end of that format's existence. One was called the SLHF2000 and the other one was the SLHF2100. And if you've got one of these in working condition, you should consider yourself very lucky. They are very desirable machines and they sell for real money on eBay. Uh, auto tracking, I think, can make life a lot easier when transferring these old digital tapes. And I wish I had one, but unfortunately I don't. And that basically concludes my presentation. Any questions? John has one. Oh, there you go. You, you were talking about the, the Tascam 3000 unit that mm -hmm. records on chips. Um, I've got the prior model, which I know you used for years, too, that records on DVD-Rs. Right. Does the DVD-RA 1000 HD. Right. That's it. The, does that have the same uh, rate converter chip in it? No. The DVR 1000, the, let me get that model number. Yeah, it does not have a sample rate converter. No. So that makes it that, not, no, not work that, too well for that, this. That okay. won't do. Okay, nope. thanks. Well, actually, that unit has an internal hard drive, and then you can burn it to a DVD. The 1000 HD will not burn to a DVD, as far as I know. But again, the problem you have if you're going to record directly to a 1000 HD is that it, you, may, you may get... The, in, the digital input receiver on the 1000 HD may accept the 44.056 kilohertz data stream, but it'll never get a proper digital lock, and it will be higher jitter as a result. No, that, that machine, you have to use a uh, sample rate converter in front of it. Yes. And the 1000, not in the 3000, though. No, nope, the 3000's got it built in. Yes. Wait a sec. Uh, uh, number one, can you re-explain how the A to D conversion in the F1 worked? Was it a single converter multiplexed between two channels, or was it one converter sampled and held, uh, two converters sampled and held, and the... the no, it was one converter that switched back and forth. So the, uh, the, the lagging channel is actually sampled later than the, the ahead channel. Is that yeah, correct? that's correct. The right channel was sampled first, then the left. Right, left, right, left. So in playback, the 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 samples uh, there still has to be a delay on the 
on, on, on between one channel and another. Is that no, correct? No, because in playback on the original F1 processor, the inner channel time delay in the D to A converters was the complement of the A to D converters. In other words, it went the other way. So there was no delay at the output. And I've actually verified with my test tones that playing back uh, a 10 kilohertz tone through the analog outputs of my original processor that there is no time delay. I tried that to make sure. No, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about whether the original sample was offset in time. The original samples uh, of, of the machine are offset in time, meaning the machine took a, a slightly different, uh, slightly later sample of the original waveform because... Uh, uh, not with a sample and hold circuit, no. No, I asked you if there's a sample and hold for two, a two-channel converter or a single one multiplexed. It's a single converter that's multiplexed. Okay, and the sample and hold would, would, would have held for a half a sample? For, it had to. For both channels? It had to in order to work. And the test tones verify that it, in fact, does work. Okay, the, the, the other thing was that do you have or is there printed uh, a paper about the lack of uh, lock on 44.0, uh, uh, you know, the, the NTSC sampling rate, uh, or is it just your uh, uh, um, observation that this is uh, occurring? Oh, no, it's not just an observation. It is, in fact, true. In fact, on the front panel of the DA3000 digital recorder is a little circular light. And if the digital input is at the proper sampling frequency, with, if you've got the sample rate converter switched off and the digital input is at a standard sample uh, frequency, the light light illuminates in blue. If you try to put the output from a PCM601 processor into the DA3000 without the sample rate converter switched on, that circular light illuminates in red, indicates that, that, indicating that it has not achieved the proper digital lock. You get sound through it, it seems to be working but you don't have a digital lock and the red light tells you that. Uh, uh, but have you verified with test signals, which you seem to be fond of using, that there is something going wrong with the signal? And second of all, you made a blanket statement and therefore you can't have, have tested all possible uh, inputs for all possible things that take SPDIF. There's been pl there has been plenty of, uh, of, of research done and plenty of stuff written on the effects of clock jitter and the fact that so, so, jitter will be higher if, if the digital input receiver does not achieve a proper digital lock. Yes, I, but, I, I, I but you made, a, you made a blanket that. statement that this cannot be done. And you cannot make a blanket statement because there may be combinations that work just perfectly fine out, out of, you know, $40, $45 equipment. Uh, I, I, I would like to see a digital input receiver that has a sa the, an input sampling frequency that's off achieve a proper digital lock. I've never seen it happen. Uh, something that conforms to SPDIF standard is supposed to take 44.056. That's part of the standards. So, as it is supposed to, uh, okay. Let as me, it is supposed to obey the, the flag that's in the signal for de-emphasis. Let me back up here. I have been through uh, several generations of outboard D to A converters. And there was a time many years ago, like back in the late 1980s, when some of the first outboard converters for home use appeared, where you didn't, in variable speed applications, I use variable speed applications at home because I have a lot of transfers of historical recordings that have been transferred at the wrong pitch. There was a time with outboard D to A converters where the digital lock, the digital window, was so wide that you didn't need a sample rate converter to use a, a pitch control on a CD transport going into the converter. It would work fine. But then in the late 1980s, early 1990s, more like early 1990s, when people started paying attention to the effects of clock jitter on, 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 on the audio, regardless of what the SP diff specification said, they began designing input receivers with a very narrow lock range because it was necessary to get rid of jitter. And you can't do it anymore. You've got to have a sample rate converter. You've tested all possible uh, outputs and inputs in this. Is it what now? You've tested all possible outputs and inputs with this. I, I, what I'm saying is you can't make a blanket statement. You can make an recommend, uh, engineering recommendation, but you can't make a blanket statement right. that this is what is happening. Okay, I'll put it to you this way. If you can find a digital input receiver that 
has optimum jitter suppression with the input sampling frequency off, by all means use it. Anybody else? Joe, in the back. We need her like 10 of these would be a great idea. Right. Um, what I can say about, uh, about the jitter suppression issue and the locking issue is that I have a very expensive DCS sample rate converter whose uh, jitter attenuation is so severe that it will not lock at all to 44056. As a matter right. of fact, it won't, it won't quasi-lock. It won't lock at all. It just it, won't it work. It mutes. Right. However, my, now, Z, my ZSYS SRC3 has no problem with it, and that's the uh, sample rate converter I use for very speed as well. Right. Uh, I want is, to the, is the DCS converter asynchronous? It probably isn't. That's what I thought, that the DCS the, because, converter, it will convert any standard sampling any frequency standard to, any to any other standard, other standard and it does it extremely not, right, well, right. but it will not right. take anything that is, yeah. uh, that is non-standard frequency. I mean, it has a whole, it'll take 22050, by the way, yeah. but, it will, but it will not take 44056. Right. Um, one other point about the auto tracking machines. You are 100% correct. I have both those machines. Unfortunately, neither of them are currently working. Well, you know what I have, what I have so read? So if anybody on, has any recommendations for somebody to fix them, please let me know. What I have read on the internet about the last one that they made is that Sony knew that they were getting out of the beta business and that was not a very well-made machine. Are you talking about the 2100? I think, uh, maybe it was the 2000. No, the 2100 is later than the 2000. Later. That, they weren't, the, that, the, that a lot of them My 2100 well. worked for 27 years, and it worked fine. Oh, okay. And then, and then uh, there's a problem on one of the boards that I can't figure can't out what it, it is. Now. Well, I'm trying. Yeah. yeah, it's a problem, no question. Like I said, they're old. One, one more quick question. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you have a jitter problem, what do you hear? Ah. Clock jitter, what I hear is that, first of all, the high frequencies become a little harsh. Ambience gets a little drier. And sometimes the, the uh, soundstage localization is not as precise. When clock jitter is high, what I hear is a throwback to the things we didn't like in early digital audio. But again, you have to have a high resolution system to hear it. I mean, you know. Uh, some systems, you know, are not resolving enough to, you know, to reveal those differences. But that's what I hear. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all for coming.